lots of passages in the canon or the Buddha after explaining the path of practice or talking about the urgency of following the path of practice. Sends the monks back to meditate. He says, look, over there are the roots of trees, over there are empty dwellings. Meditate. Don't regret later that you didn't meditate, that you didn't practice. The word he uses for meditate is to go do jhana. Jayati is the verb in Pali. It's a homonym with a verb for burning. That's when a flame burns steadily. They have lots of different words for burning in Pali. Words for raging fires. Words for smoldering fires. But the verb for a steady flame, like the flame of an oil lamp, is jayati. And it's used also for doing jhana. What you're doing is trying to make the mind steady with a clear, clear flame, with flames that have lots of flickering ups and downs are hard to read by. A steady flame is one you can read by clearly. That's the kind of quality you're trying to get in the mind, so you can read the mind. So how do you create that steady flame? The two qualities of mind are important. One is directed thought, and the other is evaluation. You direct your thoughts to a particular topic. Like the breath, keep reminding yourself to stay with the breath. And then you evaluate it. How's the breath going? Where do you feel the breath? When the breath is coming in, what are the sensations that let you know it's coming in? When it goes out, what are the sensations that let you know that it's going out? Are those sensations comfortable? If they're not, you can change them. What this means is you can focus anywhere in the body where it's clearly telling you, now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out. And notice how you're maintaining that focus. Is it a comfortable place to stay focused? Are the sensations themselves comfortable sensations? What can you do to change them if they're not? Or if they are comfortable, can you make them more comfortable? This is all part of evaluation. This is how you get started on jhana practice. Some people classify this as a samatha or tranquility practice, but the Buddha himself said you need two qualities in order to do jhana properly. One is samatha, tranquility, the other is vipassana, insight. There are two sides of the practice we're doing, and he recommends that you get them balanced. So it's not a case that you just do tranquility practice and then you go off and do insight practice. A lot of people think that way, and the question often comes up, well, how much tranquility do you need before you can do insight? But that's a question that's never addressed in the canon, because they didn't see things in those terms. They saw them as two sides of one practice. Both sides are essential. Sometimes you find that one side comes up before the other. Sometimes they arise together. Ideally, they should come together. So if you have one without the other, you want to provide a balance, bring things into balance. And the samatha side is closely related to this topic of directed thought. How do you steady your directed thought? How do you steady the mind? How do you get it to settle down, to gain confidence in its object? That's largely a question of making it comfortable, yet at the same time maintaining enough alertness and awareness so you don't blur out. To make it comfortable, you've got to get sensitive to what's going on right now. This is really important. Try to be as directly with the sensation as you can, and notice how, how good it feels. Is it something you can settle into? Once you've settled in, how do you stay there? What do you do to maintain it? And this is where a lot of the insight comes in. Because if you don't have any insight, you find yourself drifting off all the time. And it's not simply a matter of willpower forcing yourself to stay there. There has to be some understanding as well. This is where the questions related to insight come in. This is how should fabrications, in this case metal fabrications, verbal fabrications, how should they be regarded? How should they be investigated? How should they be seen with insight? And whether they should be regarded as stressful. When a thought comes into the mind, look at it simply as an instance of stress. Rather than getting involved in the content of the thought, well, first of all, see that it's inconstant. In it comes and it goes. It's a disturbance. Then secondly, see that this disturbance is stressful. And again, keep it at that level. Don't get involved in what the thought is about. Just see, oh, here comes some stress. Do I want to get involved in that? Well, no, it's stressful. 
That makes it easier to stay away from it, easier to keep the mind focused, easier to keep, keep you from getting involved. And seeing it is not self. You don't have to get involved with it. You don't have to identify with it. You don't have to take it on, which also means you don't have to push it away. If it's there, let it be there in the background. The quicker you catch sight of it simply as an instance of stress and saying, I don't have to go there. You hardly give it even, as you get better at it, you hardly even give it time to form into a coherent thought. We have a tendency in our minds that once a thought arises, you want to peer into, what's this about? And if it doesn't seem to make sense, well, how can we make sense out of this? And you get more and more involved in taking it on, making it an intelligent thought, making it a thought worth thinking. But if you see it simply as an instance of stress and catch it more and more quickly, you allow it to be a stupid thought, then you allow it to be just a half-formed thought. You allow yourself not to have to peer into everything that comes into the mind. This makes it easier to stay focused. And the question of how to investigate these fabrications, well, investigate them as skillful or unskillful. It's not the case that all thoughts, thoughts are useless. There are some that are useful, but they have their time and their place. Thoughts related to the breath are useful for our purposes right now. Thoughts related to other things, what you did yesterday, what you're going to do tomorrow, those are useless. Those are unskillful at the moment. But because we're so used to thinking, it's, it's skillful right now to focus on the issue of not thinking. Think about, think about the breath. After all, the breath itself is a fabrication. This is the kind of fabrication you want to hold on to. So it's not just because things are stressful and inconstant that you let go of all of them right off the bat. You have to focus on the ones that are skillful first. If you find yourself having trouble getting away from a particular type of thinking, well, you can learn to think in ways to analyze that kind of thinking, to see how it really is, really is someplace you don't want to go. Like that chant we had on the body right now. That's useful for lust. When you find yourself focused on lust, well, remind, what, remind yourself, what is that exactly this object that you're getting so worked up about? What's in there? Is it something you really want or not? Do you really want to go that place? You look at it, well, not really. That kind of thinking is useful. When it's done its task, then you can put it aside, get back to the breath. So the, the insight here, the, the questions that are asked to give rise to insight are questions, one, dealing with ways of not identifying with your thoughts, and then the other one is ways of evaluating. Okay, since you don't have to identify with them, what do you do with them? You see how they're useful or useless. They lead you in directions you want to go or directions you don't want to go. So even though you may not want to identify with any fabrication, still there's the fabrications that form the path, and those are the ones you want to encourage because they're skillful. This is a part of insight. The fabrications that keep the mind still and steady, keep the mind engaged in a pur the pursuit of what's skillful. Those are the ones you want to encourage. So this practice of steadying the mind, that still, steady flame, it requires both tranquility and insight. And of course, once the mind settles down, the, the insight gets more refined, the tranquility gets stronger. So the practice of focusing the mind in this way both depends on tranquility and insight, and it creates the conditions for more refined tranquility and insight. They all go together. So do your best not to see them as separate. You don't have to worry about, well, when do I do insight? When do I do concentration? They all come together. The question then becomes, if you begin to notice an imbalance in the mind, you try to bring it back into balance. If you're thinking too much and it's snuffing out your concentration, well, drop that for a while. Or if your concentration is getting too dull, you'll learn to ask a few questions about it. Because this is the whole purpose of, of jhana practice. It's not a question of showing off, well, I've got the third jhana, you've only got the second. Or I've got somebody who tells me I've attained the third jhana. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to get the mind steady enough so it can see. And when it sees, it can let go. And when it let go, then it's free. That's what this practice is all about. That's what the Buddha meant when he said, go do jhana. 
It encompasses all the aspects of the developing the mind.